Okay, so it is 12 o'clock. So I think um, as people are uh, coming to join us in the room, uh, we'll do a quick uh, introduction and then we'll get started um, on the uh, panel speaker series today. Um, so hello everybody, uh, my name is Kiana. I'm a master's student at uh, McGill's uh, in second language education. Um, my research focuses on international adoptees relearning their heritage languages and how those learning experiences contribute to their sense of identity. Um, and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everybody who's come to um, join us from far and wide today for the Plurilingual Live Speaker Series. Um, today we have a panel titled Critical Teacher Education for Equitable Learning in Multilingual Classrooms, A Possible Way Forward. Um, I'd like to start off with a, a land acknowledgement. So I am coming to you from Teodake, also known as Montreal. Um, and uh, I have the privilege to work, live and play on uh, these indigenous lands. And um, I invite you all to uh, consider um, the Indigenous lands that you might be um, coming to us from today. So, yeah, um, I'd also just, oh, sorry, here we go, apologies. Um, just uh, for a little bit of Zoom, just to go over the Zoom uh, etiquette, uh, during the talk, we ask that you please keep your video and sound off while um, people are presenting. Um, there's a few reaction features that you can use if um, you'd like, such as the thumbs up and the hands clapping feature. Um, the talk will be recorded and available on the Plurilingual Lab YouTube channel. Um, and then after the talk, we will have uh, 30 minutes for discussion. Um, this discussion will be moderated uh, by my colleague, Miguel Sanchez, and will not be recorded. Um, I would now like to pass it on to Lakshmi Oza and Jennifer Burton. All right, uh, thank you, Kiana, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, based on where you are, what your time zones are. Uh, welcome to today's panel discussion on critical teacher education for equitable learning in multilingual classroom, a possible way forward. First of all, we'd like to express our sincere gratitude to Dr. Enrique Aglante and the plurilingual land team at McGill University for inviting us to organize this panel. Your leadership in promoting dialogue around multilingualism and equitable education in, is both timely and invaluable, and we are honored to be part of this important conversation today. Uh, Jennifer, would you like to go for the next slide? Uh, my name is Lakshmi Prasad Oza. I am a PhD candidate in curriculum, instruction, and teacher education with a specialization in language and literacy education at Michigan State University, USA. Um, I am joined today by my colleague and friend, Dr. Jennifer Burton, who is an assistant professor of applied linguistics at Concordia University, Canada. The work we are presenting today is a collaborative team effort uh, with Dr. Peter DeCosta, who is a professor at Michigan State University. Dr. DeCosta is not able to join us today due to his other professional commitments and has sent his regards to all of us. We will be sharing our contact details at the end of the presentation. Uh, please feel free to be in touch if you have any questions, uh, especially to Dr. DeCosta, who is not here today. Uh, today's session is based on a special issue that the three of us co-edited for the International Multilingual Research Journal published earlier this year. Now, I would like to invite uh, Jennifer to talk a little more about what this special issue covers. Thanks, Lakshmi. So uh, the special issue included five empirical papers and two commentaries, and it focused on the connection between language, power, and critical consciousness to address equity concerns in teacher education as it relates to supporting multilingual learners. You'll see I have a, a guiding question here on the slide. So as 
teacher educators that one of the key questions that motivates our scholarship is this question here. How do teacher education programs prepare teachers to work with diverse students in schools where there exists a long standing history of marginalization and discrimination based on linguistic, cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds? So the special issue really is in response to this question, and we're bringing together research conducted in different settings in the US, in Canada and the UK. And collectively, the papers included in the special issue address several interrelated themes. Um, some of those themes are the, the notion of critical multilingual language awareness in teacher education, which is inviting us to think really how language is in, entangled with issues of identity, power, and social inequalities. Um, next, we're looking at teacher agency and activism and the role they play the crucial role they play really in empowering teacher educators and pre-service teachers to take on ownership of their practices and advocate for change within their institutions. And this empowerment is particularly important. Uh oh, did, did the, the PowerPoint disappear? Oh, it's still there? Okay. Okay, so this empowerment is uh, especially important uh, as plurilingualism and translanguaging become pedagogical approaches to counter deficit monolingual and monocultural ideologies. So transitioning from these practices, it's really important for us to uh, think about how we can refine our pedagogical practices through reflexive pedagogies for equity, and then think about uh, the importance of considering assets-based approaches, which really focus on leveraging the strengths of students, but also their communities and what they bring to the classroom. Okay, so my screen doesn't show my PowerPoint anymore, so I'm just gonna stop sharing and uh, bring bring the PowerPoint back up. Pardon for this uh, for this technical issue. Okay, here we are. Okay, screen sharing again. Okay, I'm back. All right, so how are we doing this? So we're so based on the insights really from our, our collective papers in our special issue, we're arguing really for an e ecological approach to address these issues of power and inequality, which will which might require teacher education programs to embrace um, and a uh, holistic approach to broaden the knowledge base for future generations of educators. So broadly speaking, what we mean by ecological perspective is this understanding that learning is always shaped by interrelations of programs, of individuals, of institutions, of ideas, always in context. So we believe then to truly transform educa education for multilingual learners, we must develop some critical consciousness, critical awareness about broader social and e educational issues, especially those faced by multilingual learners. Now, this includes ensuring that pre-service teachers gain the necessary knowledge, the orientation, the skills to be able to make meaningful contributions towards kind of disrupting these normative and hegemonic ideologies that are deeply rooted within our educational institutions. Um, we could do this, or one way to do this would be uh, through adopting uh, assets-based pedagogical orientation to embrace the diversity of multilingual students and also by modeling equitable classroom environments through which we believe critical reflexivity um, and inclusive pedagogical practices are, are essential in the teacher education programs. So essentially we don't believe in like kind of prescribing a, a, a one approach to, to one, one size fits all kind of model, but we think it's imperative that teacher education programs uh, are situated among broader sociopolitical issues, including language and power. And that's kind of what our uh, special issue is, is addressing and highlighting. Lakshmi, you're on mute. There you go. Thank you, yeah. Jennifer, for the wonderful overview of the special issue. Uh, now we invite the authors of the empirical papers featured in this special issue to share uh, key takeaways uh, from their studies. Uh, this special issue comprises, comprises sorry, five empirical papers examining the intersections of language, power, and critical consciousness as they relate to equity in teacher education, with a particular focus on multilingual learners. Additionally, it includes two thought-provoking commentaries, one by Dr. Jeff Bell from University of Toronto, 
and another by Dr. Jamie Stillman and Dr. Deborah Palmer from the University of Colorado Boulder. Today's panel, however, includes presentations from the authors of the five empirical papers only. On the slide, you can see a QR code that links directly to the full special issue, including the commentary, and you can uh, access uh, the special issue using the QR, QR code. Uh, please let us know if you do not have institutional access to the papers, so you can, I mean, we are happy to share the papers with you. Each presenter will have 10 minutes to share their study, after which we'll have opportunity about 30 minutes for Q&A session. We kindly ask that you hold your questions for the designated Q&A session. Uh, however, please feel free to share your thoughts and comments and questions in the chat to make it more interactive. Let us begin with our first paper uh, and, and presenter. Uh, Jennifer, next slide, please. The first presentation is titled Enhancing Pre-Service Teachers' Projective Agency for Diverse and Multilingual Classrooms Through a Course on Curriculum Development. And Dr. Dario Luis Venegas will be presenting on behalf of his team. Dr. Venegas is a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland, where he leads the master's course on second language teaching curriculum. He also serves as the director of postgraduate research in the School of Education. Over to you, Dr. Benegas, and thank you for accepting our invitation to present in this panel. Thank you, and um, hello, everyone. And can you all see my screen now? Okay, so let me, 10 minutes now, um, let me get started. And as my colleagues have already pointed out the focus of our paper is on teacher agency and I was so happy to be able to do this study with Michael Basensky and Fang Yang who also teach on this um, core course that I lead at the University of Edinburgh and second language teaching curriculum for a bit of context is a core course in our master's uh, MSc DSOL program. We usually have about more than um, 250 students, mainly from China, but also from other parts of the world. And so um, my aim with this, um, with this course is to make them think about uh, or raise their awareness of agency as this powerful interpolating concept um, that is also very practical because you know to me agency is about doing or not doing right and so when we um when we put, put together the course i said to my um colleagues well what if we do um a research study that goes alongside the actual delivery of the course. And this is something that I usually do with other courses that I teach um, because A, I'm a big fan of, um, of action research and B, because then I want to collect evidence about um, my own teaching and my students' development. And so with that um, kind of framework in mind, we came up with a question that you see there on the screen. This is a research question. In what ways does a course on language curriculum development contribute to free service teachers' understanding of teacher agency? And in this, um, for, for this study, I need to make, uh, I need to clarify that these are free service teachers and that the program doesn't offer a practicum. And so in this case, or for the purposes of this study, um, the participants, you know, the students, are thinking about agency in terms of maybe any perhaps limited experiences they have had before joining us in Edinburgh or how they um, picture themselves once they get their degree and get a job either in China or anywhere else in, in, in the world. And 
when we explicitly teach um, about agency in the course, we um, invite them to unpack this concept from three different perspectives, the ones that you can see there on, on your screen. One is what we call the social cognitive perspective, where agency is a result of internal cognitive processes that influence a person's ability to act intentionally. And so this, you know, course of action, of actions that we have in mind, but in this case, this is more at an, you might say, at an individual level. This doesn't mean that the person will be completely removed from, from their context. Then the second one is the sociocultural perspective where we understand agency as a mediated capacity to act. And the last one that goes probably in line with the overall spirit underpinning the, um, the special issue is the ecological perspective where agency is seen as a phenomenon transactionally negotiated between individual capacities and contextual materials conditions. Um, and to the students, to most of them, the concept is novel. Even though when we begin to share examples, then they realize, oh, this is what it is. <laughs> um, but it comes across as um, a new concept to them. And also it comes across as a concept that um, seems to challenge some practices or assumptions. And so when we get to that part of our conversation, we say, well, you know, we also need to understand teacher agency from different perspectives in terms of not just theoretical, but also knowledge construction and knowledge flow. And so, you know, we also want to um, bring about change in terms of, I don't know, understanding social, social justice and teacher agency from Global South epistemologies. Um, and so in this study, we understand teacher agency as what teachers decide to do or not to. And these agentic moves are informed by past or iterational experiences, future-oriented actions, and selves. You know, how they portray th themselves, how they depict themselves in this sort of ideal um, future. And what you see here on the screen is um, a few comments made from the students. And what we did here was because um, I wasn't keen on adding extra tasks to the students, all the data that we utilized to carry out this study comes from the actual delivery of the course. And you can read more about that um, in the paper. But look at what Barbara, for example, said. I can use my agency to organize and benefit from my own reflection and attend courses that can help me improve my teaching for multilingual education. And so in this case, Barbara understood that agency was not just this, you know, fancy <laughs> concept. It was a tool. It was a tool that um, they could utilize, they could employ uh, and shape to, in, in this case, um, improve their teaching for multilingual education. And then Cindy, and this is something that Cindy wrote in her um, essay. And so there's one section in the essay where they need to say, okay, what do you think you, you could do as a teacher? Just to avoid, you know, the, 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 um, the unfortunately typical statements that we even find in uh, published um, articles where, you know, like teachers should do this, teachers should do that. We, I am not in, no, in, in any position to tell teachers what they should or shouldn't do. So in this case, we said, you know, don't think about what teachers should do, think about what you could do. And so um, she wrote, in my future teaching, 
I will see myself as an agent of change who can adapt the top-down curriculum to allow my students to critically reflect on the formative value of all languages and the importance of using translanguaging to acknowledge different languages and dialects. I will also create opportunities for my students to use Mandarin or other dialects or languages in class to sample share of learning. Teaching English from a multilingual perspective is an agentive act of social justice. Isn't that beautiful? I love it. And I will work towards that aim. And so, again, in this case, you know, it was, it became, um, it emerged as a tool, but this empowering tool to, um, to produce change, to bring about change where the teacher um, sees herself in this future as an agent of change. So she's acting on that change. She's mobilizing that change. She's part of that change. And so um, in this study, we put together this framework to understand teacher agency based on what teach what this group of students uh, learned as they navigated the second language teaching curriculum course. And so because it's about how they see themselves in the future, projective teacher agency plays this um, super powerful role. But of course, that um, that is based on their past experiences as learners themselves or as teachers and what happens at their institutions. It's connected to their present. It's connected to their future, but also they seem to be using their future identities to come back to the present and reflect on their own journey now. And it is there that they begin to think about themselves in interaction with others and the institutions because you know th their fear or their concern is okay i i'm okay with my teacher agency i can do this but will i be supported will i have teacher agency or agency at a meso level you know at an institutional level um and what is amazing is that they began to make these connections between agency and social justice with this situated orientation, you know, context responsive, culturally responsive pedagogies um, from and for their own context, in particular relation to multilingualism, multilingual um, identities and, uh, and their learners as, you know, amazing beings. And this is all from me. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Dr. Vanegas, uh, for that insightful presentation. Uh, due to scheduling constraints, Dr. Vanegas will need to leave the session early. Uh, so if you have any specific questions for him, please feel free to reach out to him by email. Uh, maybe he can share his email in the chat if he wants to. Uh, or you can find it in the paper itself. Now, I would like to introduce our next paper and presenters. Uh, the paper is titled Translanguaging for Critical Multilingual Award Language Awareness, Preparing Teacher Candidates to Support Multilingual Learners in Classrooms, authored by Jennifer Burton, Wales Wong, and Sakina Radindran. Uh, Jennifer and Sakina will be presenting this study jointly uh, today. Uh, as I introduced Jennifer earlier, um, you know, I'll, I'll just be introducing Sakina this time to save some time. Dr. Sakina Rajendram is an assistant professor and coordinator of the Language and Literacy Education Program at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, University of Toronto. Her research centers on the intersection of multilingualism and teacher education, with a focus on preparing teachers to support multilingual learners through critical translanguaging and multiliteracy pedagogies. Over to you now, Dr. Burton and Dr. Rindam. Thank you, Lakshmi. 
Okay, so uh, Laxmi introduced the title of our presentation, so I'm just going to uh, skip over this slide. But um, our, importantly, our paper that we're presenting today is part of a larger three-year multi-strand study of teacher education programs in Ontario, Canada, that prepares future teachers to work with multilingual learners. And the collaborative Collaborative efforts of the project resulted in this co-authored book that was published last year in 2023. So one of the challenges that arises in preparing uh, teacher candidates or pre-service teachers to support multilingual learners is that teacher education programs center whiteness and standard English as the norm, which is problematic because as teacher candidates uh, learn, they're then reproducing this way of thinking through their teaching in their classrooms. So one approach to um, address this issue is through translanguaging as an assets-based pedagogy, uh, which intentionally incorporates multilingual learners' languages into the classroom by for learning for social justice purposes. And um, if you're following the scholarship, you'll see there's a robust body of research on translanguaging in the last uh, decade, 10 to 15 years. But as it's being adopted more widely um, as a teaching approach across different educational contexts, we're seeing that as it's taken up, the potential to democratize the, the classroom is often left behind. So a gap we're filling is that uh, little is known about how teacher candidate programs can prepare teacher candidates for supporting multilingual learners by developing specifically a critical stance on language and race. So to respond to this, uh, these challenges, our study is bringing together translanguaging with critical multilingual language awareness, or CMLA, um, which refers to various aspects of, of language use, such as the cognitive, affective, social, and performative aspect of, of using language, but also um, the power dimensions uh, and social and linguistic and racial inequalities within multilingual societies. So CMLA encourages uh, teacher candidates to move beyond surface level translanguaging and to make explicit their translanguaging design and shifts to advocate for linguistic diversity for their students. So the purpose of our paper then is um, to examine whether and how pre-service teacher candidates plan to include their multilingual learners diverse language and literacies into their mainstream K to six classrooms. And we have three research questions that we're gonna briefly go over today in our presentation. The first research question looks at what are their stances and what factors shape their, their stance, their developing translanguaging stance. The second one is we're interested in how they're planning for translanguaging in their lessons. And then finally, any challenges and limitations um, towards that translanguaging uh, planning. All right, Chakina, over to you. Thank you, Jen. So the data for this paper came from a course on supporting multilingual learners in a teacher education program in Ontario. This course took place over one semester with 12 classes and a four-week practicum in between. The teacher candidates or TCs in this class all completed the same three assignments, the first one being the My Plurilingual Journey assignment, where TCs have to prepare a paper or a presentation where they reflect on their own language learning experiences and their plurilingual identities. The second assignment was called the Profile of a Multilingual Learner, where they interact with the multilingual learner during their practicum and they write up a case study of this learner. All TCs also had to develop a set, a series of unit and lesson plans based on a subject from the Ontario curriculum with adaptations made to these lesson plans for multilingual learners. In addition to these three assignments, the TCs also wrote two reflections during the course. The first one was called the translanguaging reflection, where they described how they would design or redesign a lesson that they, they had taught based on a translanguaging strategy incorporated into the lesson. The second one is called a me mapping reflection, um, where they would watch a digital language portrait or a me mapping video uh, that was developed as part of another trend in this project. And they would reflect on the strategies to support the learners in these me mapping videos. The data sources that we analyzed for this paper included all of those assignments and the reflections that TCs uh, completed for this course, as well as individual and focus group interviews with them after the course had concluded. The data from four teacher candidates, Brenda, Faith, Mira, and Sherry, were analyzed thematically for this paper. All four TCs were multilingual, and they were preparing to teach in the primary junior division, or in other words, they were preparing to teach across kindergarten to grade six. 
And now we're going to share just a few representative examples from our findings. In response to the first question about what TC stances were towards translanguaging, we found that there was a shift in their stances that took place during the course. For example, prior to the course, Mira had preconceived ideas that we should think of and speak only one language at a time. She also recalls that she, that she had a really negative attitude towards translanguaging and thought that it was unproductive. But after completing the plurilingual journey assignment, where she had to reflect on how she uses languages in her own life, she noted a shift in her understanding of translanguaging as well, stating that I actually do a lot of translanguaging without even knowing it. And she noted that this assignment planted the seeds of the importance of being plurilingual. I'll never forget the importance of valuing students' first language and not putting them down. Next slide, please. We also found that TCs who considered themselves or discovered themselves as being plurilingual were better able to empathize with their learners on the basis of the shared language learning experiences, challenges, and identities that they had with their learners. For Mira, being plurilingual helped me in shaping my teacher's identity. I can now put myself in my students' shoes, in particular newcomers and those who are learning a foreign language. Watching the videos of real learners and interacting with learners for their case study assignment during their practicum also really helped the TCs to start developing an openness towards translanguaging. Mira, who came from Lebanon, who only moved to Canada right before starting her graduate program, said that she was able to identify with the challenges that two Syrian refugee learners faced because of the difficulties that she herself experienced while having to learn various subjects through French and English as her second languages. And now recognizing the benefits of translanguaging and even plurilingualism for herself and for those learners, she went on to make recommendations of various translanguaging strategies and resources she could use to support them in the classroom. Thanks, Rakina. So we're going to move on to the second research question now, which is looking at um, how they're planning for the strategies that they're implementing uh, within their pedagogical practices. So Sherry, her recommendation for pedagogical translanguaging focused on building a classroom-wide uh, strategy for an appreciation of languages. She also encouraged peer collaboration and she integrated technology. So one example here is, is this image you'll see of the language flower activity where students identify the languages they can speak or the languages they see written or uh, the languages they hear in their community or languages that they they dabble in. So in the first class, uh, Dr. Rajendram Shakina, she, she asked TCs to create language flowers with each petal representing a language they knew they heard or that they saw in their environment or that they wanted to learn. And Sherry, one of the, the TCs, suggested that she would use Use this language flower activity as an opportunity for her students to see different languages posted in the classroom and to build a classroom-wide appreciation for linguistic diversity. So she said that she imagined that if her, if her uh, students were doing this activity, they might think, oh, my friend also knows this language, or oh, look, my teacher speaks this language. And so the findings show that TCs incorporated many of the translanguaging strategies that they had learned in the course from Shakina into their unit and lesson plans for the purpose of supporting their students' language and learning content. Second, um, to spark one of her multilingual learners' interest in learning English, she suggested including technology-based activities because she had observed that the student had an interest uh, with computers. And then finally, in her uh, grade two social studies lesson on comparing and contrasting their home, their home and current communities, Sherry suggested that students collaborate with multilingual writing partners to translate the information from their research and descriptions of their images. Okay, so that's just quite brief, but uh, now I'd like to transition into um, the last research question, which is looking at some of the, the common challenges that the TCs faced. So the first one was that we saw a lack of engagement with pedagogical translanguaging in the practicums. So the first, uh, so for Faith, in reflecting on her first practicum, Faith felt that that her associate teacher could have planned more with the English language learner learning teacher, um, so that students could feel more like they were integrated and part of their mainstream classes. For Brenda, the practicum didn't really provide her much opportunity to work with multilingual learners. And then one of uh, Sherry's challenges was incorporating translanguaging into her teaching 
working with a multilingual whose language she was not proficient in. And so she said, since Mandarin is not her first language, she could not really understand a lot of what um, her student was saying. And they didn't really have a lot in common. So since they did not share similar interests, uh, he was the student was limiting their com- uh, conversations, which made it difficult for, for Brenda to help with tasks such as forming sentences and writing essays. So in, in Brenda's interview, she shared the same concern with speaking only two languages and worry that she would not be able to communicate with the parents who are not also fluent in English. Um, however, the resources that Shakina provided to, to the TCs in class gave her ideas on ways to connect with the parents. Another challenge uh, that we observed in, in the application was that limited pedagogical translation, the pedagogical translation was limited really to a scaffold to learning English. So reading a quote from Brenda, she says, uh, I think I have translanguaging strategies through various activities, maybe once during a day, maybe more, but making sure that English component is still there, like present in whatever they're doing. So in this statement, Brenda's understanding of the home language was solely as a, a scaffold to learn the target language, English. And similarly, Faith provided several ways to support multilingual learners through like collaboration, anchor charts, word wall, personal multilingual dictionaries, you know, same home language pairing and Google Translate. But she still made modifications that were mostly limited to home language use as either a private or a collaborative activity to scaffold to English. And also regarding their planning for the assessments of multilingual learners, we saw TCs continue to reflect the same deficit perspectives about multilingual learners um, that were inherent in the monolingual assessment frameworks from the province of Ontario. Okay, so in closing, three main takeaways from our paper. Firstly, our findings show that TC's own backgrounds, lang- their own language learning experiences and their own identities really influence their beliefs and approaches towards translanguaging and towards supporting multilingual learners. TCs, they're able to empathize with their learners and understand how to support their needs better when they themselves have experienced what it's like to move to a new country or to be in an ESL program or to be plurilingual, to be racialized or to have learned a new language. Secondly, our study suggests that it's really important for TCs not only to learn in theory about working with multilingual learners, but to actually have the opportunity to interact with and work directly with multilingual learners during the course of their teacher education programs. This significantly contributes to them being able to translate what they are learning about translanguaging into practice as they prepare to teach in English-dominant classrooms. And thirdly, our findings show that TCs do have a good developing understanding of what a translanguaging pedagogy could look like, as evidenced by the various strategies and resources that they included in their coursework. But as Jennifer said, a limitation in their planning for translanguaging is seeing it as a short-term accommodation or a short-term scaffold to facilitate students' development or transition into English, rather than as a way to actually decenter the dominance of English in curriculum and assessment. So what this shows us is that the use of translanguaging without a critical orientation will lead to mismatches between their stances and their actual proposed teaching practices. We know that systemic issues will inhibit the use of translanguaging in practice, and it's going to be easy for TCs to slip back into English-only practices once they're out there in real schools. And so we recommend combining translanguaging with a CMLA approach so that TCs can develop a more critical awareness of how languages are valued or marginalized in classrooms and how they can use translanguaging to enact more equitable policies and practices. And with that, we thank you and welcome your comments at the end. Laxmi, you're on mute again. Oh, why do I forget that every time? <laughs> Five years into Zoom and still need to learn. <laughs> anyway, uh, wonderful presentation, Dr. Barton and Dr. Indram. Yeah, so much to learn from this project. Uh, and then uh, the book you know, that you, you just shared at the end is also wonderful. You know, uh, uh, such, such a great project. Let's move now to the third paper titled uh, development of Linguistic Critical Consciousness of Multilingual Pre-Service Teachers of Color, presented by Dr. 
Laura Mahalingapa. Uh, Dr. Mahalingapa is an associate professor in applied linguistics and language education in the College of Education at the University of Maryland. Her research and teaching focuses on teacher education and critical pedagogies for the education of linguistically and culturally marginalized learners in uh, pre-K to 12 and post-secondary education context. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mahalingapa. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for attending this uh, and the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, can everyone see my screen well, the presentation? I worked this time. Okay, um, so we already saw my um, title. So I'm going to see if I can progress here. Um, the reason why I did this particular work was I spent about from 2010 um, till 2020 working in a predominantly white institution in Pennsylvania. And I had mostly 99% of my teachers in the pre-service teacher education. And this is for content teachers, not in a in, in a teach, uh, ESL or TESOL or ESOL classroom uh, program, was that I moved to Texas and I taught in teacher education programs in Texas. And the way that I approached teaching content teachers was very different because the students, most of the students, majority of the students in my class identified as people of color, as pre-service teachers of color. So I, I switched how I was teaching after 10 years, how I approached the teaching of this particular content on how to support multilingual learners in content area classrooms. So I wanted to explore whether the things I had honed over 10 years was gonna work in a different environment with multilingual students themselves, the majority who are multilingual and identified as multilingual. So I wanted to explore um, specifically their their perceptions about language, identity, and ideologies, and the, how they relate to their background and experience, and to identify pedagogical activities that raise critical con linguistic consciousness in pre-service teachers of color. So I had done, again, this work, and I had done some publications on this work previously, but I really wanted to um, see how, how these kinds of pedagogical activities in content courses would actually affect or uh, identify their critical consciousness awareness raising. So I use critical language awareness um, specifically on pre-service teachers' um, effect on their perception in, this, in these cases. Uh, so just a quick overview, um, critical, there's a critical understanding of language that's inherent in all of these activities, which considers as constituted and reflective in its socio-political and historical context. So we really, I focus in on ideologies. I found that before you can get to methods or to um, specific assessment activities, you have to first address students' ideologies and whether they think it's it's important, right, to support multilingualism in classrooms. So, you know, essentially, I think as I think Jennifer and others have said that really the teacher education classroom is reinforcing monolingual and standard ideologies that are racialized, um, that frames racialized learners as deficient and multilingualism as something that's not to be um, attained. Or it's not, a, it's not an important thing. So the thing about teacher education is that it really has been built for the needs of white monolingual students. And we have this problem in the US, at least, is that we do not have adequate representation of teachers of color in classes in our in our K-12 system, school system. And we've been trying to figure out ways to address this issue for years. And at least we're hearing up on a lot of a lot of reasons, obviously. Um, but one of those is that, again, we don't really consider their needs when we are teaching them in these pre-service teacher education courses. So I wanted to say, again, in this new context that I was in, to see how I could move towards that. And one thing I discovered in the literature and also while talking the first year I taught this course, which was on language and language acquisition, not on methods. So this course is really the foundational course that students took was to address what uh, Lindon Ozerlach called linguistic ideological dilemmas. So we, we, we speak to multilingual students about mul employing multilingual strategies, but they may not have experienced those in their past um, educational experiences. And as we know that teachers often draw on their own past experiences to address or to utilize in their own um, classrooms in the future as when they teach. Uh, we also found that teacher education can have an effect. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does have an effect on what students, what teachers end up doing once they're out of their teacher education programs. So I thought we could address this 
specific linguistic ideological dilemmas where students are raised and, and are educated in these systems that again legitimize standard and monolingual ideologies and downplay or delegitimize or consider deficit the multilingual identities and multilingual practices that students bring with them to classrooms. So how do we address these issues and critical language awareness is the way that I um, consider to do it. And I infused critical language awareness throughout the whole course. So it wasn't one activity, it was an intentional infusing, infusion of um, every step of the um, of critical language awareness throughout the whole course. So critical language awareness, again, I'm uh, using Fairclough's 2014-2001 to look at uh, language as in, is invested in power relations and ideological processes. It's every day, it's everywhere, we can't avoid it, and we don't know that it is. So uh, one of my tasks in the class was really to raise that awareness um, through self-reflections, and, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, and also to raise con critical consciousness. So that was um, one thing that I really wanted to focus on was not just make them aware, but also what they can do with it. So crit uh, critical consciousness raising is not only knowing that it's there, but trying to act, trying to disrupt the status quo, which is which maintains the power balances and the, those balances that maintain monolingualism in classrooms. Um, so my research questions are, what are some effects of the CLA coursework on multilingual pre-service teachers' perceptions about the following measures, and this is a quantitative study, on um, language ideologies um, supporting students' multilingual, multi multiple languages outside the classroom? So I think a lot of teachers will be like, oh yeah, we can use first language in the classroom, um, but they're not, they don't ever or rarely support saying, yes, once you leave this classroom, please use multilingual resources, right? So. It's about also whether they support it outside classroom, whether they're advocating for students multiple languages in the classroom and other critical perspectives. So it was a quantitative stu a study that draws on survey data from pre-service teachers. We had 48 service pre-service teachers participate. They were all education elementary majors. So in Texas, everyone gets an ESL certification or bilingual ed certification. That's the way the elementary programs are built. It was in an HSI, a Hispanic serving institution, um, a very large one. And we had probably two, two to 250 students a year, but in my sections, I had 48 um, who identified as pre-service teachers of color. They were, uh, the whole class was not pre-service teachers of color, but they were, um, in, they were probably about more than half the class. Um, most were identified, identified as Hispanic slash Latina slash Latinx, 8% identified as Black, 4% as Asian, and 4% as multiracial, but they all identified as bilingual or multilingual. So these are the CLA components that I infused throughout the whole course. Um, reflection is one of, is the first step, and that's thinking about students' own language use and what language literacy and discourses mean to us, and it's thinking critically about their own positionality. So I use critical literacy narratives in an autobiography where they position themselves in a language within the broader context. And in terms of systematizing, you identify texts that contain discursive features in the world and those that don't. So we use a critical media literacy activity where students identify discursive features in real world texts that they see every day and in classroom texts as well. Um, to explain was to, was to analyze the discourse discursive features and how social meaning and ideologies can be hidden within them. Um, so I use critical discourse analysis to analyze those um, I, the artifacts that they brought from the real world and the classroom. So they, for instance, um, identified some discursive features in classroom texts that they may use. And then developing practice. How do you change discourses in their own lives in the classroom? And we practice this not only through thinking about what to do with activities in the classroom, but also we wrote advocacy letters to different constituencies that we thought would affect students, like their congressperson or their another teacher or one student. Um, one of my favorite ones was wrote a letter to herself when she was an elementary stu student, and telling her that it's okay to use multiple languages in her life. So this is just some of the activities. This is a slide that we looked about critical language awareness from Aline's article on um, Barack Obama. So this, this is about African-American language specifically. We also discussed mock Spanish and how it permeates society. Um, uh, we also looked at different classroom texts um, that analyze elementary school um, course uh, textbooks that we may use in elementary classrooms and how that ideologies, even though subtle, are still infused in every kind of text that we see in schools. 
Um, they, they did a basic perception uh, questionnaire you know, with a Likert scale, and we did repeated ANOVA test to assess whether it had any effect. So we did a pre and post. Um, basically, we found that it did have an effect on various aspects, three or four of the measures. The biggest one was on critical perspectives. Um, there was a significant difference for support for students, first languages outside of school, and language ideology. And there wasn't a significant difference for support for first languages in the classroom. I think this is because it was already high in the pretest. These are all, uh, un unlike with um, the non the monolingual students who identify as monolingual, there was a lot of movement on that one, but for um, which is a different paper. But for, for the students who are already multilingual, they considered it, their, their pretests were already really high. So that's why we didn't see a significant difference, but we, don't, we saw significant differences for the other measures for sure. So I think that um, we always ask whether to serve, whether our what we're doing in the classroom works, right? Whether we're achieving what we want to want to achieve. And I think um, this gave me hope that we can see some movement on critical perspectives. Obviously, there's more room to work. There's more work to do, but we can have a targeted approach if we do work to infuse it within the whole curriculum, as some, some people have done, or in certain classes. Um, we can work to uh, increase critical consciousness with our pre-service teachers. And I think that focusing on students' backgrounds and understanding the needs of all the pre-service teachers that come into our programs is very important uh, to understand how we can support them and the kind of coursework that we need to provide for them. And we can, again, we need to have explicit discussions about this. So we can't shy away from, um, from these kinds of hard conversations. And I think that in, in the past, when I was the only perhaps person of color representing um, the content of what I was trying to teach with a predominantly white institution, that the students reinforced it with each other. They, they heard stories from different groups of people from different backgrounds, speaking different languages, and they were able to understand it a little better um, because they, they were, were learning from one another. So I think having these diverse um, constituencies in, in teacher education is very important as well. That's it for me. Thank you for, and I look forward to the conversation at the end. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mahalingupa. Uh, moving on, uh, Dr. Lucia cardenas Curiel will present the next paper, which is titled, The Best Way to Get to Know a Student is to Know Their Community, Fostering Pre-Service Teachers' Critical Multilingual Language Awareness Through Linguistic Community Works. Dr. Cardinal Curiel is an assistant professor of bilingual multilingual education at Michigan State University. She examines bi multilingual learners, bi multilingualism, bi literacy development, and multiliteracy practices to promote a just education. Dr. Cardinal Curiel received the 2018 National Association of Bilingual Education Digital Award and the Arthur Appleby Award for Excellence in Research in 2020. Over to you, Dr. Cardinal Curiel. Thank you, Laxmi. Hmm. We're good? Yeah, okay. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, first, I wanna thank Angelica Galante from the Plurilingual Lab at McGill University for this invitation. And Jennifer and Laxmi, just for putting together this special issue, I, I feel honored um, to be among this special group of scholars. Um, as Laxmi shared, my name is Lucia Cardenas Curiel and I'm an assistant professor at Michigan State University. And today I will be sharing with you how our pre-service teachers develop critical multilingual um, language awareness through linguistic community walks in our teacher preparation program at Michigan State University. I started practicing neighborhood walks back in Austin, Texas. So in contracts, to Dr. Laura, I moved from Texas to Michigan State. Um, these neighborhood walks um, were, um, I, I did them together with Dr. Aide Rodriguez um, to prepare bilingual pre-service teachers. And I decided to bring these pedagogical practices to Michigan State University. In collaboration with MSU's past doctoral student instructors and building on the previous scholarship on community engagement and critical pre-service teacher education, we adapted this assignment 
and asked pre-service teachers who mostly are white, monolingual, and female pursuing an ESL endorsement to visit the communities served by their field placement schools for their mentor teaching practices. So um, building from all of the past presentations, we not only look at the curriculum, uh, at the lesson planning or the linguistic ideologies, but we wanted our um, pre-service teachers to visit the communities where the children recite at, because it is relevant and important to be able to engage with this community knowledge. Laxmi, Luching, Mehen, and I started deep discussions about pre-service teachers' responsive, responses to this assignment, and collectively, our positionality as multilingual individuals, teacher educators, and former K-12 teachers enhances our understanding of the significance of critical approaches to education, including multilingual language awareness. The Linguistic Community Walk Project was the first major assignment that requires students to explore the community where they were placed for their mentor teaching practice. The community they explore were diverse, but most of the regions were around the university where they were taken the ESL endorsement course. While doing the Community Walk Project, all pre-service teachers were expected to investigate the history of the community, collect demographic data, and explore resources available to multilingual learners at the local library, and visit at least eight specific places to better learn about the linguistic landscape of the chosen community. In our thinking together, we found a space to study the impact of practicing linguistic community walks for pre-service teachers' understanding of the existing disparities in access to community resources for individuals from di different linguistic backgrounds and how this ex ex experience influences their pedagogical orientations to support the teaching and learning of multilingual learners. We drew from critical multilingual language awareness and observed the impact of these walks on pre-service teachers' language ideologies and how they envision their future pedagogy. A critical multilingual language awareness allows teachers to understand language as socially creative, socially changeable, to give voice and educate all students equitably, to challenge existing inequalities, and to promote a socially just language learning environment. Due to our short time together, I'm not going into details on the methodology and methods, and I'm sure you can refer to those in our article. Instead, I will focus on the impact of linguistic community walks in our students' CMLA development. Our findings suggest how engaging white monolingual pre-service teachers in understanding the historical, demographic, and social cultural situation of the community surrounding their placement schools supported developing awareness of language hierarchies existing in society. So for example, a student shared in their reflection, I hadn't noticed a diversity of cultures and languages in the community before, and I felt bad that some language and cultural resources are not well supported in public areas. In class, we also engage pre-service teachers in learning about language policies. We study how the racially motivated policy and programs favoring the white monolingual English speakers have contributed to establish, establishing the US as a white public space where English is commonly used in the community. Pre-service teachers take close look at the language services offered by different public places, showing how mostly English was used despite of a sizable population from other linguistic communities. So another student said, although there are some places of worship, grocery stores, and resources at the library for speakers of other languages, it seems that most of the places and facilities cater to English speakers. By immersing themselves in various community spaces and closely observing the linguistic resources accessible to speakers of different languages, the pre-service teachers gain valuable insights into the advantages into the advantages for their monolingual English speaking backgrounds in the community they visited. So this realization was particularly significant for the students who came from monolingual English speaking household and attended schools with students and teachers from similar backgrounds. So they said, I knew knowing English was important to succeed in this country, but I had never thought how I benefited because of my background coming from an English speaking home. This project gave me new perspectives to look at language, power, and privilege. 
Analysis of the participants' written and oral reflections revealed their commitments to support multilingual learners as future teachers. After doing the community walk project, our, our pre-service teachers have noticed the importance of valuing multilingual identities in the classroom. One participant shared that as teachers, we need to help students find a stronger sense of belonging through the internet or resources in other regions. And they reflected that students also need their own cultural identity in an English dominant community. So they said, the best way to get to know a student is to get to know their community and where they come from. It is a big part of their culture and who they are. Building relevant atmosphere and activities for multilingual learners can support and sustain their language and culture. Pre-service teachers also started envisioning authentic and culturally relevant classrooms while doing their community walk project. For example, one pre-service teacher shared that she would promote other languages besides English in her future classroom and create a safe space to make sure that every student feels included. I would really like to make sure that I promote other languages besides just English. I just wanna be mindful of that moving forward and making sure that every student feel included and their native language is represented in the classroom, which is a safe space for them. So in conclusion, knowing about the disproportionate allocation of resources that put linguistically and culturally marginalized communities at a disadvantage, challenge pre-service teachers to think critically about their students who encounter these public spaces on an everyday basis. This further inspired them to rethink their own pedagogical orientations, considering the need for additional support that they may need to provide to multilingual learners in their own future classrooms. So thank you so much. I did provide a QR code to access our article. And again, thank you to Laxmi, Luching, and Mayhen who think thought together um, and, and as we got to know uh, pre-service teachers um, responses to this assignment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cardinus Curiel, uh, for representing all of us. You know, it was it was wonderful working with you in this paper, and thank you for highlighting that here. Uh, we now uh, bring you uh, the final empirical paper featured in the special issue. Uh, Dr. Angelica Galante will present her co-authored paper, The Fall of Bilingualism, Teacher Candidates' Voices on the Implementation of Critical Plurilingualism in English Language Teaching. Dr. Angelica Galante is the Associate Professor and William Dawson Scholar at McGill University, Canada. Her research interests include plurilingual education, language pedagogy, linguistic discrimination and justice, and teacher education. Dr. Galante has received several awards for research excellence, including the 2024 McGill University's President Prize and the 2019 Pat Clifford Award by EdCan Network. Uh, thank you, Dr. Galante, for agreeing to share your research here. Thank you very much, Lakshmi. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I just wanted to uh, clarify that this uh, article has been written by myself and John Wayne de la Cruz. He is a PhD student here under my supervision. Um, he wasn't able to be here, so I'm going to be presenting on behalf of the group. All right, to start, um, this research was funded by the Fond de Hechat Société Coutu uh, in Quebec and also the Center for Study of Learning and Performance. Just to give you a little bit of context, so um, Canada is uh, a unique place and Quebec, where I am located, is even more unique. So Canada, we have uh, both English and French as official languages. However, in Quebec, the province where I am located, French is the official language. So French is the majority language and English is a minority language, which is very difficult to think of English as a minority language uh, nowadays, but especially in the global sphere. So English, however, is a dominant language in the country. So there are uh, lots of um, issues in terms of we need to preserve the French language in Quebec. Otherwise, we're going to be dominated by English outside, you know, uh, of the, the, the province. Um, the teachers who I was working with um, are teacher candidates, so pre-service teachers, who are preparing to become ESL teachers in Quebec. So this is not a general course preparing, you know, teachers in general. It's to prepare 
ESL teachers to teach in Quebec. So once again, thinking about English as this, you know, elephant, big elephant in, in, the, in Canada, um, and these teachers are going to be preparing, uh, be, they are going to be prepared to teach English in Quebec, where French is a minority, uh, sorry, it's a majority language. We say this about Quebec, but we know that in, in Canada overall, we have over 200 languages and there are, there is so much diversity. So classes here are not to teach English to Francophone students or French speaking students, it's to really teach English to uh, plurilingual learners. Uh, to give you an overview about language proje projections in Canada, diversity will continue to inc increase. Uh, there are projections that we are going to have fewer speakers of English as a mother tongue, fewer speakers of French as a mother tongue. So these are the two official languages. And we are going to have an increase of over 6% of speakers of other languages other than English and French. It's important to mention this because uh, one of the goals of the, the teacher education program here is to really prepare teachers of English to teach plurilingual learners and not only, you know, bilingual learners, which used to be the case in the past here in this country. Um, even more important is to mention where we are located. So McGill University is located in Montreal. And in Montreal, the diversity of languages is even higher across the province. So we have over 50% of the population here either being born outside of Canada or having immigrant parents. So people like me, I am an immigrant from Brazil. I arrived here. I already speak, you know, Portuguese, Spanish, English, and I'm learning French. But if I didn't speak, you know, English, I would probably be in an ESL class if I were, you know, a, a kid uh, going to school. Uh, important also to mention that immigrant uh, kids, they need to go to a French speaking school. Uh, so they don't have a choice to go to an English speaking school. Um, this is, of course, a measure in the, um, in the province to uh, create Francophone speakers in the province. However, even going to a French speaking schools, every kid has uh, ESL classes. So they're going to be, you know, having majority of the, the program in French and having English as a second language classes. So English is still the minority. It would be almost uh, as if we, you, you were learning English as a foreign language in another country. So in China or in Brazil, for example. Um, this project is, the, the paper was written, um, is one of the case studies that we created, but it's a bigger project called Plurilingual Shift. Um, and here we have the research team. So it was a very plurilingual research team as well of teacher educators uh, working together to make pedagogical change. Um, this study in particular was conducted in the teaching um, English as a second language program at McGill. Here's a picture of a classroom. So it's a regular classroom where the teacher candidates come um, to have um, a four-year B.Ed. program. So um, in order to become an English as a second language teacher in Quebec, you need to do four years of a Bachelor of Education program. Uh, I'm saying this because, you know, Bachelor of Education programs are different um, in different parts of the, the province, uh, the, not the province, different parts of Canada and also in other countries. So here they spend four years uh, simply preparing to become English as a second language teacher. Uh, the course was delivered in the winter 2023. Um, the goals were to equip teacher candidates with critical plurilingual pedagogy and investigate their perceptions before and after implementation. So I heard that in this panel, uh, some teacher education programs have a practicum, some don't have a practicum. Uh, in this course, they did have a practicum, so they were equipped with pedagogy in the classroom, in this classroom here, and then they went to Quebec schools, uh, mostly Quebec schools, some students went to other schools as well at, outside of the province to teach English, to teach the lessons that they have prepared. 
Um, and then we collected information uh, before and after implementation. This was important for us because, um, you know, we had already documented, uh, uh, there, there's tons of research talking about the benefits of plurilingual pedagogy, um, but there are still, you know, issues of, well, but how do we do that in the, you know, how do we implement that? And what are teachers' perceptions after implementation? Are they the same? Were they feeling empowered? What were the challenges? Uh, there were 16 participants. Um, they were all plurilingual, plurilingual meaning at least three languages. So this is very, very common uh, in Quebec. When you go to a language classroom here or a, a, a university classroom, people speak three or more languages, English, French, plus one more or two or three. Um, and 50% of the this population of teacher candidates had English as their first language. So 50% did not have English as a first language. So they were uh, plurilingual too. In Quebec, um, every teacher education program needs to include um, competencies, professional competencies coming from the reference framework for professional competencies of Quebec. Um, this was published in 2021, is the most recent one, and there are 13 professional competencies. I'm not going to talk about them all, but some of them that are very important for this study is uh, teachers need to be prepared to teach in an increased linguistic and cultural diverse setting. Um, they are. Um, they need to be prepared to integrate indigenous perspectives in language education or in any education. Right you know, for this particular uh, study was for English language education, and they have to be prepared to use digital technologies, especially because, um, especially after COVID nineteen. Very important to mention that although there is the integration of indigenous perspectives, there is no uh, recipe really on how to do that. So we also rely on um, documents uh, that have been created by the First Nations Education Council that guide us on how we can prepare teacher candidates to include um, indigenous values, indigenous uh, materials, indigenous voices into the classroom. And by indigenous here, we don't mean only indigenous uh, from the territory around where we are located, but also indigenous to the students who are going to be educated. So, you know, sometimes we have indigenous from South America and the global South, et cetera, et cetera. So two research questions guided the study. The first one, what are teachers, uh, teacher candidates' understandings of critical plurilingualism? And what are teacher candidates' perceptions of affordances and challenges of critical plurilingual approaches before and after implementation. I'll provide a very brief overview of uh, some of the topics of the readings and discussions, what students had to do in class. They, they read a lot of uh, Indigenous perspectives in education, not only in my course, but other courses as well. Challenging monolingual norms in ESL classes, uh, backwards design for lesson planning using an action-oriented approach. We use an action-oriented approach because it provides uh, the teacher candidates with agency and also the students who are going to be educated with agency to create projects that are relevant to them and society. Um, we also use critical plurilingual pedagogies and we list some of them here. Uh, authentic indigenous content in lesson plans and infusing plurilingual and pluricultural competence in lesson plans. By plurilingual pedagogies, we use plurilingualism here as an umbrella term that encompasses strategies like translanguaging, uh, cross-linguistic approaches, cross-cultural and intercultural approaches, pluriliteracies, plural linguistic landscaping, multimodality, etc. Um, to facilitate the transition between a monolingual or bilingual way of teaching English as a second language, we also created a guide to support educators' transition to plurilingual pedagogies. Um, and we also use this guide in this um, teacher education program. Now, this guide does not provide exactly what to do, but it provides um, tasks that can inform how, how teacher candidates can include uh, plurilingualism in the classroom. We also included, um, we created five um, tutorials on different strategies. We focus on only five strategies. What are cross-linguistic analysis and what can be done in the classroom? Uh, Cross-cultural comparisons, translanguaging, translation as mediation, and pluriliteracies. We found that creating tutorials for teachers 
and teacher candidates who are new to plurilingualism uh, provide a better sense of what can be done in the classroom. And of course, we invite them to create their own pedagogy. Um, the kind of data collection we uh, had were um, used with five instruments. These were our, all instruments. Um, we say instruments, but they were gathered during the course, right? So online posts on VoiceThread and Perusal, these are two technological tools that we were using to gather discussion. Language tasks completed by the groups of students. Lesson plans that were completed individually. Then they uh, got their lesson plans, they taught their lesson um, in Quebec schools, and then they came back uh, and we had a final reflection to talk about affordances, uh, challenges, and also research field notes that we used. This was a qualitative case study using interpreted content analysis uh, with two coders, myself and John, um, with all the data. So just to give you an example of what a lesson plan using an action-oriented approach was like, uh, the teachers did not have textbooks. They could choose materials um, to include in their own lessons. Um, here we have an example of um, a group of teacher candidates who chose an indigenous animated movie called Totem um, to engage students in discussions uh, related to family, uh, related to uh, respecting elders, et cetera, et cetera. And then students created um, their impressions. They, they talked about their impressions of this movie and how this movie um, uh, engages in reflection of their own responsibilities in their communities and um, with uh, the people in their communities. Um, after that, the teachers uh, created uh, plurilingual strategies uh, in the lesson plan, and they also uh, used CFR descriptors to um, as goals for that particular lesson. Now, the lesson sometimes was a lesson of like two hours, sometimes three hours, <laughs> sometimes an hour and a half. So it was pretty much, um, you know, up to the teacher to think about a sequence and uh, come up with steps uh, so that they could uh, um, finish this task. Um, the final product of this task was a movie gallery where students, the ESL students, right, they would watch a movie in a language other than English or French, French because it's the majority language here. Um, it could be a, a movie, you know, that it was um, uh, suggested by the family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they would get uh, the information of the movie and create a movie review following, of course, you know, a checklist of uh, things that are included in movie reviews. And this review was done in two languages, at least in English, because it was the target language, and also any language in the repertoire of the students. So we didn't really have like English or French, which is something that is very common here. It was English plus one or two more languages or three more languages. So the end goal was a movie gallery where teachers, parents, um, students, they were all invited in and the students were talking about the movie that they had watched. Uh, they had posters in different languages and they could engage with the audience in different languages as well. So what were the uh, findings here from the teacher uh, candidate's perspectives? The first one was a new interpretation of what language is as nonlinear, multimodal, and asymmetric, uh, including language varieties, registers, uh, visual representations, and also the cl critical plurilingual pedagogies was seen as a decolonial approach, which is something that was very important in our context. Uh, so just one example of a teacher, she said, my understanding of language learning and identity has drastically changed after learning about plurilingualism. I used to have a deficit view of myself regarding uh, my language abilities. And unfortunately, a lot of my friends who are plurilingual also have a deficit view. Um, very important to mention that a lot of people who are plurilingual, who speak three, four, or five languages, because of the bilingual framework we have here, they usually have a tendency to say that they are bilingual. And that's why um, the title of our paper is The Fall of Bilingualism, because we feel that bilingualism, in a way, um, provides uh, um, limitations to how we can see ourselves as plurilingual. 
Another one about affordances before and after implementation, there were several affordances, learner empowerment, uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization, learning investment and engagement. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the teacher empowerment and disempowerment. Uh, teach, the, the teacher candidates felt really empowered because they had the knowledge on how to do, you know, to include plurilingual strategies in the language classroom. But at the same time, the disempowerment came because um, when teachers went to their practicum, they had to collaborate with a cooperating teacher. So let's say the real teacher who had the class and the students, you know, the teacher candidates were invited to teach one lesson, but it was not their classroom. So many times, um, and this, this is what happens generally here, is that, you know, teachers who are in schools who were educated, let's say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, they have not been uh, trained to use plurilingual strategies or critical language approach. So there is, um, you know, um, uh, um, uh, kind of a tension, right? Because the teachers here, they are equipped with this. So when they go to the classroom, uh, some of the teachers say, no, you cannot use other languages in this, in this classroom. It has to be English only. Um, in terms of equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization, one of the teachers said having more than one language policy in the classroom enhances creativity, inclusion, sense of community, awareness of other languages and cultures, and allows students to learn about different viewpoints and customs, much more of different cultures, including indigenous languages and cultures in Canada and other countries. So as a summary of what the plurilingual pedagogies, how the plurilingual pedagogies were understood by the teachers, the teachers uh, felt that plurilingual pedagogies really centered student voices. It leverages uh, student agency, um, engaging in criticality, in empathy. It also values different, uh, different ways of knowing and being, different languages and varieties, and challenges colonial conceptualizations of language, especially here with this dichotomy of English and French, which are the two colonial uh, languages. Some recommendations to view students as plurilinguals and avoid labels like English language learners, learn about languages and cultures of the students, engage uh, them in using the languages of their, in their repertoire in pedagogical practices, using different strategies for different purposes and different lessons like cross-linguistic, cross-cultural, translanguaging, et cetera, get students to create personalized social relevant uh, projects like vlogs, uh, blog posts, poems, presentations, like uh, the movie gallery was one example in this um, study, and not to assess linguistic competence only, assess other competences such as plurilingual, pluricultural competence, mediation, online interaction, etc. Uh, if you'd like to know more about the, the resources um, for teacher educators and also the publications, you can go to this web page. I'll put this in the chat later. Thank you so much. Muito obrigada. Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Dr. Galante, for your wonderful presentation. So that brings us to the end of uh, the presentation of five empirical papers. I would like to thank everyone for your active participation. We now move to the Q&A you know, session, which will be moderated by a colleague from Plurilingual Lab. But I wanted to also share the contact information of the three of us, you know, the, the, the co-agents of this special issue. There is a, co, there is a QR code as well, so you can uh, you know, access the resources from the paper from there. If you uh, cannot access the papers, please let me or any other people, individual authors or editors know so we can share with you. Uh, yeah, so thank we now you. move to the question and answer, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Lamix, and, and thank you, Dr. Galanti. I guess...